aircraft performance, regulations and operating minima. As you are very well aware, many rules and regulations exist regarding aircraft performance and operating regulations and minima. Flight Operations Manual Part A, Chapter 8, covers many aspects and one should have a solid knowledge of its contents. Another manual in this regard is Flight Operations Manual, Part C, Route and Aerodrome Instructions and Information. Both manuals will be discussed in depth throughout your upgrade training. The following topics are suggested for review or revision, non-exhaustive list. Approach Bands Takeoff Minima Circling Minima RVR State Minima Area and Airfield Brief Airport and Area Clearance Certificate Fire Cover Operations to CAT 2 and CAT 3 Alpha and CAT 3 Bravo Minima Medical the Information in Flight Operations Manual, Part A, Chapters 6, 8, and 14 gives excellent advice on medical matters, including the following important topics. Being fully aware of the advice given is of paramount importance. Problems with sick passengers. Refusing sick passengers. Obtaining help and medical assistance by radio, a cars, and telephone. Expectant mothers. Infectious disease. Health Regulations Dangerous Goods As dangerous goods training is covered as part of the biannual ground refreshers, you should be well briefed on this subject. It is not suggested that an intimate knowledge of the dangerous goods regulations is required. However a good working knowledge along with the ability to find appropriate guidance material is essential. To this end it is suggested that you review the appropriate sections of the Flight Operations Manual, Part A, Chapter 9, together with the excellent course handout received during your DGS course it is important to have good knowledge of the procedures when dealing with incidents involving dangerous goods utilizing the ICAO Emergency Response Guide, the Red Book. New Situations, New People, New Challenges This part of the syllabus comprises an introduction to some of the new situations and new people that you will encounter as a captain. As a newly promoted captain, you will come across situations that you may have experienced as a first officer but are now required to take responsibility for as captain. Similarly, you will have to communicate and deal with people, either individually or in groups, with whom you have previously had little or no contact. As your experience in command grows, most of this will become second nature. In the meantime, this section gives some guidance in these areas as a first step in the right direction. Specific information is given to cover some of the new situations in order that correct procedures are known and the pitfalls are avoided. However, having specific procedures for dealing with people is not possible. People are individuals and must be treated as such in order to encourage them to do their best. Guidance of a general nature on the other hand regarding the content of communication is possible and, where appropriate, is given. It is important to remember that the style of your communication will be unique to you. By giving some prior consideration to this you will at least ensure that ambiguity is avoided and offense is not given. In dealing with personnel and coping with situations. Some situations are bound to be more demanding than others. Do not be overwhelmed by this, use all available resources and consider all possibilities before selecting your optimum solution. Remember, there are no problems, only solutions. Flight Deck Crew First Officers As a captain, the majority of your dealings with other pilots will now be with first officers. You are now the senior pilot on board, the one that others, including your first officer, look to for guidance and leadership and of course solve those tricky problems that they cannot solve themselves. Your first officer is your senior crew member, your second in command, or if you prefer an apprentice captain. Accordingly, your first officer deserves to be treated with respect by all concerned but in particular by you. Working on the basis that the first officer is provided to work as an airborne clerk and is aboard merely to keep your paperwork in order, and occasionally you reluctantly let him or her fly the aircraft, which has proven to be wrong, counterproductive, and in many cases dangerous. He or she is unlikely to respect you as a captain if you operate on the one-man band principle and consequently is unlikely to perform optimally. Equally, you are failing to contribute to enriching and enhancing the experience that they'll need when they become captains. Always remember that not so long ago you were in exactly the same situation. The following points are worthy of consideration. Your first officer may be older and or more experienced as a pilot than you. Do not be overawed by this situation. A first officer who is truly a professional pilot will take this situation in his stride and so should you. At all times your first officer is a valuable source of a second opinion, more so when you have a very experienced first officer. 
Situations may arise where it is more prudent to allow the first officer to handle the aircraft whilst you manage the problem. With problems on the ground it is often best to leave the first officer in charge of the aircraft whilst you are elsewhere dealing with a problem. Occasions will arise when a change of control is advisable. First officer's leg, but conditions place the operation outside co-pilot's handling limits, refer to Flight Operations Manual, Part A, Responsibilities as a Commander. Your leg, but the need arises for a lengthy HF call or any other situation that would distract you from your PF duties unduly. The first officer's performance is not up to standard. If the first officer's performance is not up to standard in any area you should let them know. Improvement is unlikely if the individual is not aware of any shortcomings. Major or continued problems might warrant a discreet word with the fleet manager. Delegation of any task to the first officer does not absolve you from responsibility. In this respect, you must be aware that the experience levels of our co-pilots vary enormously and this should be a major consideration when deciding which legs to delegate to first officers. Do not allow the first officer's handling of the aircraft to create a situation beyond your ability to recover. If you have any doubt about the manner in which the aircraft is being handled you have two possible options. The first is to give instructions or advice to your first officer to stop a situation from deteriorating and thereafter to improve it. The second is to take control of yourself and correct it. It must always be clear who is flying the aircraft. This is particularly true when a change of handling pilot occurs. The time-honored, you have control routine should be used. Should it be necessary to debrief your first officer for some shortcoming in their performance, it is essential to do this out of earshot of other crew or ground staff and particularly passengers. The flight deck should provide adequate privacy for a quiet word. Shouting matches are not to be contemplated. A clear understanding of who does what in both normal and non-normal circumstances is essential. First Officer Briefings If your first officer gives a takeoff or landing brief that is deficient or employs a technique that you do not wish to use, for example flex takeoff when wind shear is reported, then clearly you must correct his briefing and explain why. Remember, always try to clear any ambiguity, and try to solve any problem on board your aircraft so both pilots can go home after the flight with a pleasant feeling. This is a skill any good commander should possess and failure to do so you should consider it as a personal challenge for you as captain to acquire that skill. Captains flying together. It is occasionally necessary, first officer shortage, to schedule two captains to fly together. From the company's point of view, this is a good husbanding of resources. From the pilot's point of view, it is not always the most popular of duties. It should not be the onerous task that some perceive it to be. On certain fleets, all captains are checked to operate as PNF right-hand seat for routine duties but are also able to handle the aircraft from the right-hand seat in emergencies, pilot incapacitation for example. This is facilitated by a right-hand seat check as part of every captain's proficiency check. So, in most circumstances, there is no reason why two captains cannot share the flying, each taking a turn in the left-hand seat and being captain and PF simultaneously. The colleague in the right-hand seat is fulfilling the PNF or PM role of first officer when he is occupying that seat. By operating like this there can be no doubt or confusion as to just who is in charge of the aircraft. Each pilot has a clearly defined area of responsibility within the flight deck and will operate in his appropriate capacity, PF or PNF, during both normal and non-normal operations. Nothing could be simpler. Problems do occasionally arise when a captain feels uneasy with operating from the right-hand seat as PNF or PM. This can lead to an unpleasant atmosphere in the flight deck, which in the worst case could be potentially dangerous. Anyone in this category should accept their temporary change of role with good grace and bear the following in mind. It is an opportunity to reacquaint themselves with the role and tasks of the first officer. It is possible to learn something from watching another captain at work. All of us can if we are really honest about it. It should be viewed as any duty delegated by the company. It implies no downgrading of a captain's rank and we should be professional in our approach towards this delegation. Handing over to the next crew. Deuce. Put charts and manuals away. Tidy up. Dispose of cups, newspapers, and any other rubbish. Ensure all paperwork is completed properly. This includes countersigning any new cabin defects. Also, ensure that further reports in the tech log are submitted as required and that the wording of any new defects is unambiguous and technically correct. If there is no ground support arranged for any extra servicing work that you are aware of before leaving the aircraft, for example, windscreens to be cleared, water tank refill, 
toilet servicing, etc. Pass on verbally any information that you can to the next crew that will be of assistance to them. Aircraft technical status, en route or destination weather, down route problems, for example, nav aids, runways, etc. that may just have gone out of service. Shutdown checks including the securing checklist if the next crew or maintenance is not there to take over. Make sure the aircraft is secure or left in charge of a responsible person. Don't. Habitually align IRSs. Enter a route or set up FMGCs, flight deck for departure, as the crew operating the flight should be the ones entering the data. Leave the airplane with APU running if an engineer or the next crew is not there to take charge.